So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to Brussels. Lovely morning it is. And a very, very warm welcome to the International Artificial Intelligence Summit 2023, brought to you by Forum Europe and by Euronews. My name is Maeve McMahon, I'm a journalist with Euronews, and I'm thrilled to be your host today. What a week to discuss artificial intelligence. I feel we're at the right place and we're at the right time. Just last week, we saw the UK Safety Summit. Just last week, we saw um, President Joe Biden sign off on that executive order for safe and trustworthy artificial intelligence. And here in Brussels, all eyes, of course, are on the AI Act proposal. Negotiations to continue in the so-called trilogues on the 6th of December, with a lot of political pressure on all those involved to get that over the line before European elections take place next June. The big challenge, of course, is to how to create regulation that's fair, that works, but that does not kill innovation. That's the big question that we will be posing today with an action-packed agenda with around 42 speakers. As you've seen, we've kept the panels short and sweet and the coffee breaks long, so you can get to know each other, you can network. We'll also have a networking reception after the conference today, the conference that will be closed by the Vice President of the European Commission, Vera Jourova, who is the face now of the European Commission when it comes to AI and represented the bloc recently in Hiroshima at the Internet Governance um, Forum there. So for all of you in the room, you're very, very welcome. You can get involved um, by posing questions, of course, to all the speakers. For those online, I believe you're about 1,000 people, so good morning to you. You can get involved by using Slido and also by using our hashtag, which is AIConf2023. At this stage, I would like, of course, to extend a warm welcome to all the sponsors today, Access Partnership, Amazon, BSA, the Software Alliance, um, Fiscal Note, IBM, Microsoft, Salesforce, and SAP. Thank you so much to you, and thanks, of course, to our speakers as well for coming from near and far to be with us here today. And of course, we wouldn't be here either without the Forum for Cooperation on Artificial Intelligence. That's a collaboration between the Brookings Institute in DC and the CEPS, so the Centre for European Policy Studies here in Brussels. This organisation, or this collaboration, is fronted by three experts and distinguished senior fellows, Cameron Kerry, Joshua Melser and Andrea Renda. And the three gentlemen happen to be here in the room with us this morning, which we are thrilled uh, to share with you. And they will now kick off uh, the International Summit 2023 for us. So gentlemen, very, very welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maeve. It's a pleasure to be working with one of my favorite journalists in town and with working with Euronews, working with uh, uh, Forum Europe. Forum Europe is uh, an organization that I think most of you know uh, because many of the big conferences in town are organized uh, by Forum Europe. Uh, I have been a speaker and moderator for many years with them. I really appreciate their professionalism and we're now partners. We work together in a project called the TTD, the Trade and Technology Dialogue, which support all the 10 working groups of the TTC, the Trade and Technology Council, between the EU and the US, and who knows, maybe we'll talk about it throughout the day, what the transatlantic relations can do for AI. But here, I'm, I'm so happy also to be on stage with Cam and Josh, and uh, to tell you a little bit about the Forum for Cooperation in AI. Um, this is something that we created, especially uh, with Cam. Cam came to Brussels almost four years ago, and four years ago, like in, AI years is like 400 years ago, right? Uh, AI was not on the news. We were talking about uh, uh, standardization being what it should be with Agit uh, before the, <laughs> the start of the conference. It was boring as it should be, right? Now it's become even, even standards are a fancy topic. And so what we decided with Cam, uh, maybe we should launch at least a transatlantic set of dialogues because the work was sort of ramping up in the EU. Not much was happening in the US at the time, but the G7 and the OECD were already very, very active. And so say maybe we should see whether there could be some cooperation. And so what became a first attempt uh, ended up being 
a series of 20 dialogues, uh, all uh, virtual, all by invitation only, and all uh, multi-stakeholder and very rich and very well attended. Uh, what was initially transatlantic became a big community with at least seven governments constantly represented in these dialogues. And the fact that we took a, uh, if you wish, a more distanced or more impartial view, meaning we are not, not the G7, not the OECD, not UNESCO, we are observing from afar what is happening, perhaps gave us the possibility and gave participants the possibility of being more open and uh, transparent and more frank in exchanging ideas uh, under so-called Chatham House rules. So uh, since then, throughout these 20 dialogues, we have explored uh, areas for cooperation. We published a progress report in 2021. We looked in particular at regulatory cooperation. We look at the role of standards and standardization. We look at cooperation in research and development. And we got ready by building this body of knowledge through a variety and a series of publications for the, well, what is now the avalanche of new initiatives that we've seen over the past weeks. And a real avalanche, right, Cam? I'd leave it over to you mm -hmm. to describe what's going on now. Well, thank, uh, thanks, Andrea, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to Forum Europe, Euro News, and uh, all of our sponsors. I'm, the, as Maeve has re recounted, uh, uh, you know, these past two weeks uh, have uh, been extraordinary in the AI world. Um, uh, somebody said uh, that that you know this could be described as the the World Cup of AI. Uh, a friend uh, said if this were a movie, it would be everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, it's been dizzying. I mean, as as Maeve recounted, we've had an AI executive order. Uh, we've had the, uh, the safety summit, uh, G7 code of conduct, uh, the EU uh, trilogue coming to its end game, um, and countries lining up uh, across five continents uh, to adopt legislative frameworks of one kind or another. Um, you know, the, the Bletchley uh, uh, declaration last week said that the issues uh, surrounding AI are inherently international in nature um, and so are best addressed by international cooperation. That has been a founding premise of our forum on cooperation. And we are seeing it bear fruit in the, you know, the many steps that are being taken you know, towards cooperation, towards common elements, uh, um, and towards concrete uh, action plans. Uh, um, so that's what we're going to explore uh, today. We are, uh, are going to uh, talk uh, publicly um, with uh, officials uh, uh, and uh, experts, uh, uh, thought leaders who have been involved in these issues. Um, and do in a public way what we have been doing privately in all of those, those round tables. So now let me turn it over to Josh Meltzer to, to talk a little bit about how we're going to do that. Um, great. And again, welcome everyone and thanks to Forum Europe and, and Euronews uh, for hosting today. And great to see a lot of familiar faces <coughs> and look forward to meeting uh, new people today. So certainly, building on what's come now, we are looking to understand what all this means for international cooperation in AI governance. What works, what doesn't work. Certainly as part of the work that we've been doing in FCI, the Forum on Cooperation in AI, is looking at all the domestic governance efforts on AI and looking at how do we build interoperability and alignment amongst these AI efforts. And a lot of this is very focused on what's practical and what's achievable. How can we identify where there are commonalities and how we can make these systems talk to each other? How can we get at the implications? Because a lot of the domestic governance efforts will have international impacts, so we want to get at what these impacts are to make sure that they don't unnecessarily prevent um, innovation or uptake of AI. And how can we learn from all the different approaches to AI that are being evolved 
in the US, in the EU, in Canada, Japan, in parts of Africa and elsewhere. So there's a big learning effort underway as well. And a lot of what we are here today will kind of get at what's happening in key economies and key countries domestically, but also what's happening internationally and how does this fit together and what works and how do we look forward to more effective alignment and international cooperation in AI. So with that, um, we look forward to a very rich day and I'll turn it back over to Maeve. Thank you. A round of applause there for our three gentlemen, Cameron, uh, Joshua and Andrea Renda. But if you liked what you heard on stage, don't you worry, they'll be back much more later on throughout the day, moderating a number of the panels. So we really look forward to them. I can feel the giddiness and excitement in their voices about the momentum right now when it comes to artificial intelligence. So I'm really excited to hear more in those panels. But now it is time to hear from the EU capitals and find out how they're grappling with this fast-paced world of artificial intelligence. And in just a couple of minutes, we'll be inviting up on stage the Irish Minister for Trade, Enterprise and Jobs, Simon Coveney. A warm welcome to yourself. Great to see you here with us this morning, Simon Coveney. Ireland, of course, it is no secret that it is one of Europe's tech hubs. It will probably have no problem um, investing in AI, attracting a lot of talent in the next couple of decades. So we're very excited as well to hear from you, Minister. But first, as you might know, Spain is currently presiding over the European Union and has set itself the challenge of trying to conclude these talks on the AI Act before the end of its term in December. So we wanted to get the view from Spain and from the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister in charge of digitalization, that's Nadia Calvino. So we sent Calvino, so we sent our Euronews' Jaime Velasquez to sit down with her over in Madrid and you can take a look now at what she had to say. Spain has taken uh, the initiative about Europe's digitalization. So tell me, what is your vision on AI and how do you think it will impact the economy and also the labor markets? Well, indeed, when we took office uh, in 2018, that's five years ago, we already knew that digitalization would be one of the key levers to drive growth, prosperity and modernization of our country. Of course, we didn't know at the time that uh, everything would be accelerated exponentially. And we didn't know that we would have the European funds, the next generation EU recovery plan that would allow us to undertake a very, very ambitious reform and investment program. Time is of the essence. Uh, digitalization is accelerating and we need to make sure that we have the right framework to ensure that it does support innovation and brings prosperity and growth and good quality jobs, seizing all the opportunities without falling in the risks and, uh, and uh, being able to also face the challenges which are derived from this technological revolution, this industrial revolution that is taking place around us right now. Artificial intelligence will bring a lot of uh, great opportunities in almost every field, but there's also a lot of concerns on how this can impact the people's privacy or even their individual and social rights. So framework to can impact the people's privacy or even their individual and social rights. So what uh, citizens want to know is what you politicians can do to uh, get the most out of artificial intelligence uh, uh, without having uh, the unwanted consequences, the dangers of AI. Ensuring that the digitalization process uh, preserves our rights and, and values that we can ensure safety, trust and confidence in citizens and, and corporations and countries, the good functioning of our democracies. That is a top priority for us and that's why when we adopted our artificial intelligence strategy back in 2020, in parallel we adopted a charter of digital rights which has inspired the work which is going on at European level but also in the Latin American countries and at global level in the United Nations. And I think it is of the, it's essential that we ensure that this uh, technological revolution, this new industrial, this new digital economy that is in the making, 
uh, it leads to a more prosperous but also a fair society, avoiding biases and ensuring inclusiveness for all citizens throughout the country. That is our, our great challenge, but the good news is that there have been major agreements and breakthroughs in the last couple of weeks. So the governance framework and the appropriate regulatory framework is also being made around us as we speak. Mm -hmm. How do you think is the best way to regulate artificial intelligence? Should it be uh, through regulations uh, made by individual states or should it be done at the multinational level? Should it be uh, industry guidelines or maybe through a dedicated agency? For example, uh, Spain was one of the first countries to create an especially dedicated uh, agency for AI. What is your take on that? Well, it would be great if self-regulation would work, but what we are seeing these days is that it doesn't. I mean, the Data Protection Agency at European level is already having to, to take measures with regards to privacy. Uh, the G7 has put in place a voluntary uh, guiding or guidelines um, that, that could pave the way and, and mark the, uh, the direction. The UN has established uh, um, an advisory body to try to come up with the appropriate regulation at global level. And by the way, uh, Spain is co-chairing this new advisory body, which shows the leadership of our country in the area of artificial intelligence. So there are many ongoing initiatives which show that at the end of the day, uh, we have to put up measures which work at national level, at European level and at global level. It is very clear that we cannot ensure that artificial intelligence uh, goes at the right direction just uh, using our national mechanisms and, and rules because it is a global challenge, uh, one where I would hope that all countries are aligned to ensure that the outcome leads to better societies, more resilient economies, a better future. I guess one of the main challenges, where, given the uh, global nature of uh, artificial intelligence development, is how to foster uh, cooperation and collaboration between countries that have uh, very diverse uh, cultural backgrounds, social backgrounds, and even uh, different priorities. How can we do that? Well, indeed, it is very challenging because it's a technological race taking place in the private sector and also between large jurisdictions, large countries, the superpowers in, in the world. Uh, also because there are very different views as to who, who owns the data, how to protect the privacy of citizens, what is the right balance between security and privacy. So it is challenging, but it is also unavoidable. And so I think it's very good that initiatives are ongoing at the EUN level and also that uh, certain uh, fora, uh, such as the Bletchley Park, uh, a very symbolic uh, place also, that's where Alan Turing cracked the Nazi code. And this meeting has brought together Chinese and US representatives. So I think we have to continue bringing forward and, and supporting initiatives that ensure that all the world's large mega powers in the area of artificial intelligence see eye to eye, understand each other and cooperate to have a, a better governance at, at global level. Actually, we succeeded in doing it in the area of uh, nuclear energy and we are confronted with a similar challenge when we're talking about artificial intelligence. So we have to continue to work until we succeed. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot uh, for being with us uh, today. I don't know if you would like to add something or, or say to uh, people that are watching us right now from uh, Brussels in the uh, International AI Summit you are opening, by the way. Well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. The digitalization process is unstoppable, but the future is not written. So it is in our hand to take now the right decisions and set up the right regulatory and governance framework to ensure that technological developments lead to more resilient, more stable societies, more inclusive and better economies also. Uh, it is in our hands and fora and discussions such as the one that I am honored to open today are contributing to shaping this better world. So I wish you all the best in these very interesting discussions and look forward to seeing you in person soon. 
Well, thank you very much to Minister Cavigno there for sharing her thoughts with us and officially inaugurating and opening our conference here in Brussels. And thanks as well to Jaume Valesquez, Euronews' correspondent over in Madrid. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, we said we'd be getting the view from Ireland, from Dublin. And I'd now like to invite uh, the Irish Minister for Jobs, uh, Trade and Enterprise, Simon Coveney, to join me here up on stage uh, to share a few words. First, perhaps, with your views on how you're currently looking at the future of AI, what's at your, on your desk uh, on a daily basis. And um, you can speak here from the podium or here, wherever you like, and then I might ask you a couple of questions. OK, Great. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I know the general trend when you're at uh, tech summits like this is that you, uh, that you have a microphone around your ear and you walk back and forth on the stage talking to people, but um, I'm going to do it the more traditional way for now and then maybe take questions after that. Uh, but first of all, can I just say I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I think this is an extraordinarily important discussion. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Forum Europe and Euronews uh, for hosting today and thank our sponsors for, for making this happen. Uh, this is a timely discussion. Uh, the world is talking about how we respond to the opportunities and challenges of AI. Uh, politicians and regulators are trying to get their heads around how we regulate a moving target uh, because uh, uh, AI and its applications are literally changing by the week. Um, and so I think this is a, this is a challenge uh, that I hope the European Union can give leadership on, uh, but also needs to be part of a, a global response and a global alliance uh, that I hope can take shape uh, in the coming months and years uh, with open minds uh, and with a, a willingness to partner with parts of the world um, that um, have been traditionally challenging perhaps, but in, in the area of technology, I think we need to keep trying. I'd like to thank uh, Minister uh, Nadia uh, Cavigno for her welcome insights on the Spanish perspective, which is not that dissimilar to Ireland's, I'm glad to say. Uh, sharing perspectives in a forum like this, I think, is particularly important as we move forward together uh, in what I hope can be a strong partnership and collaboration both within the European Union and outside it. The themes uh, that will be coming up at today's event, I think, reveal the central importance of AI to our economies and societies and the importance of getting AI, AI governments, governance arrangements right through all of us working together, listening to industry, and of course, listening to consumer representative bodies as well. AI is a powerful tool. And as we've seen in recent months, it's, fast, it's a fast evolving technology that is having and will continue to have huge impacts on economies and societies across the world. This is not a technology of the future. It is an evolving technology of the present. It's changing the way we work and live, opening up new ways of addressing problems in almost every field. AI will certainly create a vast array of efficiencies. It will boost productivity, and it offers the potential to make significant strides towards sustainability and a net zero future. But while recognizing its enormous potential, we must also acknowledge that these powerful technologies pose threats also. It's clear that we need to address these threats through balanced and proportionate regulation. Hence, the EU AI Act. But we can also address these threats through global discussions and collaboration to ensure safe and trustworthy AI across the globe. Ireland's membership of the European Union is a critical part of our approach to the digital economy more generally. And, and it's also central to our approach now to how we respond to AI. As Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment in Ireland, my ministry is leading an international, uh, on international negotiations on the AI Act and the Council of Europe Convention on AI as well. Once agreement has been reached on the AI Act, and I do expect that that will happen in the coming months, it will be perhaps the most comprehensive piece of AI regulation anywhere in the world, and an example of the standards setting role that the EU can play in a global context, which I think is crucial, 
as this technology, of course, is global. The Council of Europe Convention on AI will also bring together a wide global community uh, working on ethical and trustworthy AI. This supports responsible innovation and will benefit societies and ultimately our economies too. So Ireland will continue to work together with our international partners on all aspects of AI governance and regulation. In this context, we're engaging with organisations including the OECD uh, and UNESCO uh, and are uh, an active member of the Global Partnership on AI, all of which are focusing on global governance. Just to focus on an Irish context uh, for a few minutes. One of the important themes today is pushing national excellence into a global arena, sharing information, sharing mistakes and successes to ensure that we can learn from each other. In Ireland, we've tried to be particularly progressive in this area when it comes to our own national strategy for AI. Launched in July 2021, our strategy, which is entitled AI Here for Good, provides high-level direction on the design, development and deployment and governance of AI in Ireland. It represents a, an integrated framework to manage the expected socio-economic benefits that AI presents. It looks at subjects such as societal opportunities and challenges of AI, at enterprise development and deployment of AI, at our uh, innovative uh, ecosystems, um, the, the use of AI in the public sector, and most crucially, ensuring we have a workforce that is prepared for AI in terms of what's developing before our eyes. The strategy has a strong economic and enterprise focus, as you'd expect, and particular attention is paid to ethical and trustworthy AI. We're focusing on both the benefits and challenges of the technology to ensure that the fundamental rights of our people are protected while also looking towards opportunities for responsible innovation in areas such as healthcare, education and our uh, public facing services. That's easy to say, not so easy to implement though in reality. Our national strategy is aligned with the evolving EU policy direction of ensuring both an ecosystem of innovation and excellence but also an ecosystem that we can trust. It favours a governance and regulatory framework that avoids setting unnecessary barriers while promoting responsible innovation. It includes the adoption of an agile and collaborative approach which sets out high-level principles and involves a range of governance and, and regulatory mechanisms. To support the implementation of our national AI strategy, we're currently establishing an AI Advisory Council for Government, which will be in place before the end of the year and will have a lot of technical as well as regulatory expertise. The Council's role will be to provide independent expert advice to government on artificial intelligence policy, including providing insights on trends, opportunities and emerging challenges. It will have a specific focus on building public trust and promoting the development of ethical person-centred AI through public communications and awareness building. We've also appointed an AI ambassador. Her name is Dr. Dr. Patricia Scanlon, who has just completed her first year in the role. While this is a voluntary role, our ambassador plays a crucial part in demystifying AI by leading the national conversation on this important subject. I have to say that's been a particularly successful project to create a face that people can trust to explain AI uh, in terms of its complexity, uh, its challenges, its risks, its opportunities. Uh, somebody that the public will listen to and recognise uh, as an independent expert has worked well for us and I think it's something worth replicating in other countries. We've established uh, an enterprise digital advisory forum which focuses on industry adoption of AI and other digital technologies. We're also finalising interim guidelines on trustworthy and ethical use of AI in our public sector. And undoubtedly, there is extraordinary opportunity there, which are founded on the principles set out by the European Union high-level group on AI to make sure that we have consistency with what's happening in other parts of our union. 
Within our research and innovation ecosystem, we've established Ireland's first European digital innovation hub for AI as well. All of these elements together ensure that a sound governance system is evolving for a, a safe design development and I hope use of AI into the future. What we've been witnessing in recent weeks, the pace of negotiations and work on the EU AI Act, the recently published executive order in the US, the work of the AI Safety Summit in the UK, which I think was a success, the ongoing work of the OECD in relation to the core definition of AI, the publication of the G7 principles on AI, and the upcoming GPAI Summit in New Delhi. These are all, I think, incredibly positive developments, pointing to a strong basis for international collaboration on governance on AI and demonstrating a clear determination uh, that is global, I hope, in our determination to, to work together, uh, recognizing the opportunities, but also the threats that AI poses. So can I thank the organizers again uh, and the sponsors, but more importantly, can I thank everybody who's taken the time to attend today in person and of course online. Um, Ireland is a country that is, um, uh, that may be small in size, and population uh, in comparison to many others uh, across the European Union and across the world. But we are a country that has seen our economy driven by technology uh, and digital platforms. Uh, we are a country that has many of the world's largest technology co uh, companies headquartered out of Ireland or headquartered for Europe and EMEA out of Ireland. Uh, we are a country that is going to be central to, to regulating a digital single market in the future uh, because of the country of origin principle uh, and the scale uh, and size of the concentration of tech companies and their research programs in Ireland. Uh, and so we want to be central to this discussion and will be, uh, but we also want to work in a collaborative way with other uh, countries within the European Union and of course further afield to make sure that we can share um, the, uh, this challenge uh, and ensure that we have as much consistency as we possibly can across the European Union. To my mind, Europe doing this on its own uh, doesn't solve the problem. Uh, it creates some barriers, some protections, some guardrails uh, in terms of how AI is developed and applied across the European Union. But in truth, this is a global challenge that doesn't recognize borders. Uh, and so we have to try to build an alliance, I think, uh, to ensure that, that this e extraordinary technology uh, can be applied uh, in a way that, um, um, that is as safe as we can make it, uh, while at the same time allows for its benefits to, to unfold uh, for all of our economies uh, and indeed the, the people that we represent. So I look forward to people's comments and questions. And, and once again, uh, thank you for the opportunity. This is an extraordinarily timely summit um, uh, in the middle, I think, of a, of a very serious global effort uh, to get our heads around how we regulate this technology for the future. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Minister. You can take a seat there, and I will sit right here beside you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have any questions for the Minister, we have a couple of minutes. I've seen there's lots of questions coming in as well online, so thank you so much for that. Um, but Minister, just on the AI Act, as we heard earlier, the political pressure is on to get it done before the elections. Um, how important is it that it gets done? And how big an undertaking will it be for, for capitals? I mean, surely it will be overwhelming. Well, first of all, I think it is important that it gets done. You know, I think the European Union has raised an expectation now. Um, uh, there's been a lot of speeches made by people like me and others uh, that, have, um, that have set the ambition that Europe wants to give leadership globally uh, on, on how to regulate something as complex as an evolving AI technology. So I think we have to deliver on that promise. Um, but to answer I think the question... Yeah, but but, but, the, but the, the, I think we need to be careful here. This isn't just about getting this done in time. Uh, it's also more important uh, that it's done well. Uh, and I think the danger here is we try to do too much, perhaps. Uh, and we find that 
the, the definitions and the guardrails that we're putting in place perhaps are out of date within months, never mind years. Um, so the, I think the real challenge here is that the, uh, the, the trilog process that's ongoing at the moment between the Parliament, the Commission and Member States is, uh, uh, is plugged into as much knowledge as we can get from industry uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, how we future-proof this regulation. Because I have no doubt that we'll be coming back next year and the year after and in five years' time uh, upgrading and changing and amending regulations and legislation as the technology poses new threats and new applications uh, and so on. But I think the starting point has to be as flexible and as future-proofed as we can make it. Um, it's got to be risk-based. So in other words, we focus our attention on where the risk is in terms of the application of the technology as opposed to trying to regulate the technology itself, which I think is impossible. Um, so, but, but look, I think we have to be open to all different perspectives in this process. But, um, but for me, getting a, getting a foundation regulation in place that's future-proof, that's risk-based, is where we need to start. If we need to add other elements to it, uh, as time goes by, well, then so be it. But uh, I, I think it would be, it would be a mistake to, uh, to try to do too much too quickly uh, in the context of a technology that is evolving at such a pace. Well, of course, because as we've seen, um, we've had surprises during the negotiations, like ChatGPT popping up, and that you know took many uh, negotiators by surprise. But just you did mention industry. And a lot of but there'll be more chat GDPs. You, you, you know, the, 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 like if you if you speak to the the people who are working on this technology in in big companies, um, they will tell you themselves that they don't know where this is going. You, you know, you know. So 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 how can we as politicians be be predicting where we're going to be? Which is why I think if we're clever here, uh, we've got to try to be. Uh, um, and I think the commission, by the way, has got this right. By the way, um, uh, I mean, you know, the, there are you know things around the edges that can improve and change probably, but I think the approach of the Commission is right on this uh, to try to to um, to put a risk-based approach which 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 categorizes the application of AI at different risk levels and then applying different uh, a different burden of regulation depending on risk level uh, in terms of transparency and so on. That, that makes sense to me. Um, Even though just you mentioned industry, just to pick up on the fact that you think the commission has got it right. Um, industry, though, are a bit concerned that if Europe over-regulates, it should, yeah. could be just slamming the door on no, innovation. No, 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 and we're concerned on that too. You know, so, so if we over-regulate in this space, we will simply see uh, technology leakage out of the European Union. You know, and, and I think that's not a good outcome. Uh, if, if companies feel they have to leave the European Union to, to develop uh, new applications, new technology, uh, new uh, you know, AI systems and platforms, because they don't, they don't feel they can do it in Europe because they're overregulated, that, that's a bad outcome. Um, but it's, it's also why we need to be speaking to partners in other parts of the world to try to get a consensus, if possible. Uh, and look, there will be people who'll say, you know, you can't trust X, you can't trust Y, we shouldn't be talking to them. You know, I'm sorry, but that's, that is, I think, you know, uh, creating a blind spot here that, I, that we will regret in a few years' time. Um, there are, uh, we need to try to be as inclusive as we possibly can, even if there are trust issues and inconsistencies in other policies. Um, but, you know, if, you know, if, if Europe and the US decide to go it alone on this with, with other select partners that they're comfortable with, you know, I think we'll simply see AI uh, developments shift to other parts of the world. Um, uh, and, and I think uh, that's, that's the real danger here. So look, you know, it, may be, it may not work to try to, to create a global consensus, but I think we have an obligation to try at this early stage in, mm. in trying to regulate for a technology that is rapidly evolving, as we say. And just briefly, Minister, because you mentioned Ireland, of course, being a hub here and the future of AI, how it could transform the country. But at the same time, Irish people and your voters are hearing messages like AI will take our jobs. We heard as well Elon Musk last week. Yeah. How are you dealing with that fear mongering? Perhaps people would call it in the AI world. They reckon that the benefits, of course, outweigh the risks here. But what's the message that you tell the people? 
Well, I think, I mean, I think AI and, and machine learning and robotics are going to replace some jobs. You know, I mean, let's, let's be honest about that. Like, I think for us to say to people, no one's job is at risk from AI or from digital technologies more generally, like, it's just not true. So let's, let's not say it. But at the same time, let's look at how economies have, have evolved on the back of technology replacing certain jobs. If you take Ireland, it's a very good example. You know, at one point in my lifetime, early in my lifetime, Ireland was seen as a low-cost destination for basic manufacturing. Um, and technology has, has replaced an awful lot of that now, and Ireland today is seen as not a low-cost destination, but a destination of high skills, uh, medium cost, uh, where, where technology is driving new ways of doing things. And that has replaced certain workforces in certain areas, but it's also created new opportunities and new jobs. And we're at full employment today. Our economy's never been stronger. Um, and you know, certain jobs have been replaced by robots and, uh, 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 and, um, you know, and, and digital technologies. And so I think AI, yes, AI is going to change the way in which economies function. Uh, and as governments, we need to respond to that by upskilling, reskilling, uh, creating new, jo new job opportunities on the back of the efficiencies that AI can deliver, uh, as opposed to, uh, to promising people that actually it won't change their lives or employment prospects at all. It will. Um, but we have to adapt to that. And I think overall, there can be more positives than negatives from that change more positives negatives. If, we, if, we, if we manage it properly. If you manage it properly. Just looking around the room there to see if we have any questions from the floor. We have one gentleman there. Anyone on the other side of the room? If you just introduce yourself, please, and keep your question short. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Henri Perre. I'm the founder of a small uh, startup. And we are working on AI, or the next generation of AI, which will provide trust and, uh, and engagement. So I am very interested about uh, the fact that uh, in, within Ireland, you name a doctor about um, being the face of AI to evangelize and explain to everyone uh, what will be the, the AI consequences. And, uh, and there is a sort of elevation of consciousness about uh, AI usage and, uh, and risk as well. Um, my question is more about, um, we've, we must now, because we know that we will not be able to regulate everything, uh, exactly as you say, because um, uh, it's um, evolving so fast. And your question? And my question is about, uh, we should provide governability to reveal intention, and, uh, and the problem is, today, most of the, the providers are embedding in their own intention into their technology, and it's not transparent. Okay. So, yeah. uh, what are we doing to bring and force them to reveal their intentions? So, question on transparency. Thank you so much for your question. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, we'll take that question. Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, uh, your comment in relation to, to our decision to put in place a kind of a, a go-to trusted person as an AI ambassador, you know, <laughs> The, the thinking behind that was that most members of the public really are reading about and hearing about AI, but they're not quite sure what it is in terms of a tangible change to their lives and the technology they use from their phones to their cars, to their heating systems, to their, you know. Uh, um, and so in truth, I think the public have limited trust of politicians and sometimes journalists too, um, and uh, although rarely journalists. Uh, <laughs> um, um, but 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 if you could if you could put in place an independent, accepted expert um, that was you know not linked to industry, not linked to government, not selling anything, but simply explaining uh, and answering questions. Well, we thought that was an asset. You know, and, uh, and Dr. Scanlon in Ireland has been an asset, I think, in the AI discussion uh, and the explanation that's there. Uh, and uh, as I said, I think, it, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good model that, that perhaps other countries might, might like to consider. Um, on the transparency thing, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, this, is, this comes back to the definition issue. You know, if you have sort of basic applications of AI that are, that are driving efficiencies in terms of how a blood sample is taken or, or whatever, then you know, I think we have to be careful that we don't try to put in reporting systems and transparency models that, that potentially 
tie, tie us up in bureaucracy and paperwork uh, and cost when actually we can get good basic applications that don't have high risk we should just get on with it in my view like that should be just be part of digitalization um, where we have higher risk models that are being used that are that are collecting data using data in a way that does create potential risk uh, to uh, to how data is, is used uh, then I think we do have to have systems that are about transparency and reporting um, the question is whether we try to manage that at a country by country level or centrally within the European Union I think that's something that's being debated and discussed at the moment in the context of the AI Act you know uh, personally I think most of us or all of us uh, across the European Union have market surveillance mechanisms and agencies that do a pretty good job uh, and I think we should we should try to to get you know, advice and common standards coming from a central office, perhaps in Brussels, but, but with our, within our own economies. Um, um, if we try to have a full enforcement role for a central EU office, uh, I think that, that does potentially create bu bureaucracy, backlogs, slowdowns, and so on. And I think we need to be a bit careful there. But, but the principle around transparency for high-risk AI products is very sound, and I think we have to find a way of getting that done efficiently. Okay. Minister, there was a gentleman. Andrea, did you want to pose a question? Yes. If there very time. brief, and then brief answer, because we've already stolen Perfect. a bit of time Sorry, from yeah. the panel. I'll be, I'll be brief. Minister Coveney, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned both the ecosystem of trust and the ecosystem of excellence, right? Uh, which is what the European Commission had put in the white paper on AI back in yeah. 2020. And you also mentioned that there is a risk that we are overdoing on the ecosystem of trust. Uh, are we underdoing on the ecosystem of excellence? Meaning, are we doing enough there? Uh, what could we do to avoid that Europe becomes a mere user of AI and so it becomes a producer of AI? Well, I, I mean, I think we have to learn from history here. Y you know, Europe has not been good at building the technologies of the future. You know, there are some exceptions to that in terms of aviation, you know, uh, car technology. Um, uh, I think we're doing an awful lot in the, you know, in the green economy space now uh, in terms of leading on climate innovation and so on. I think that's really good. But if, if you look at technology and you look at the biggest companies in the world, have they grown out of Europe? By and large, no. You know? so, so, uh, and instead, we are effectively inviting in a, a, and housing US and Chinese companies uh, uh, you know, into Europe uh, as, um, you know, as foreign direct investment and so on. I think Europe has to get much better at actually building global companies out of Europe with the support of policy um, um, so, that, so that we are, we are creating and generating the, the innovation and skills and capacity for growth and research out of Europe. Uh, and I think we need to be more proactive about that than we have been, if I'm honest. Uh, I mean, there are notable exceptions to that, of course, uh, coming out of my own country and many others represented in this room. But in general, uh, I think Europe needs to be a more competitive place and space to, to build um, uh, technologies that are going to change the world in the future. Um, and, and if they're being developed in Europe, in, Europe, in, Euro in, in, in Europe's universities, uh, and building uh, 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 startups uh, uh, and, uh, and companies out of Europe, then they are easier to regulate to because they originate from here. So, so in my view, the, the excellence and the innovation element to this argument is, is hugely important, even though politicians, because of the pressure they're under and the questions that they have to constantly field, will naturally be pulled towards the protection of consumers, uh, the protection of the public, uh, data protection, um, um, you know, guarding against rogue actors, uh, and all of that's really important uh, in terms of protecting our democracies. But 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 if we if all of our focus is pulled into that debate, uh, uh, then some other part of the world is actually driving the excellence and the innovation side, and Europe misses out. Uh, and I think that's why we have to constantly force ourselves back into the other space as well. Uh, even though it, it mightn't be as emotive politically, um, but it is very important for the future. Like I would like to see that in three years and five years and ten years' time, we have French and German and Spanish and Irish and Czech and Swedish companies that are growing and developing new AI applications that are changing the world. 
um, and um, as opposed to just big US names. While they're hugely welcome here, um, certainly very welcome in Ireland, um, and we work with them, um, uh, we'd like to see Europe developing that, that ecosystem as well. Um, I think that's a, a very clear kind of wake up call perhaps to Brussels and to our conference today and a good comment perhaps to conclude uh, this interview and set the tone for the discussion today. Minister Simon Coveney, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's and we'll see you later. We'll see yeah? you later. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. So. We heard there from Simon Coveney, Minister Simon Coveney, that um, industry, there's a lot at stake, of course, for industry. And that's where the next panel comes in, because we've heard, of course, now from the politicians. We heard from Madrid. We got the view from Dublin. And now it's time to hear from industry and from those who are working on a day-to-day -day basis with AI. And they know the reality on the ground. And they're moving much faster, perhaps, than politicians, policymakers, and members of the European Parliament. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome up on stage first Dr. Gemma Galdon-Clavel. Where is Gemma? Gemma, welcome. Uh, also, Davio Larnote. Or Gemma, um, you can take a seat up here, Gemma. Yeah, beside me. So Gemma Caldon clavel is the CEO and founder of Etikas Tech. That is a company offering ethics advice to international, regional, and national public and private organizations. I believe you were just in Singapore last week, but you're based in DC. Today you're in Brussels, so I believe you're perfectly placed. You've got your ears <laughs> on the ground globally um, to bring some good input into our discussion. So great to see you. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you so much. Joined here as well by Davio Larnote, a local uh, from Belgium here. So good to see you. He's the co-founder and the CEO of Radix. That's a Belgian-based artificial intelligence solution provider that works, I believe, on hundreds of AI projects. You also have a podcast. So good to have you with us here in the room as well. Thank you. Bob Kimball, where is Bob? Already over there. Bob Kimball is the Vice President and Associate General Counsel of Legal for Amazon Web Services and the leader of a worldwide team creating new products for the cloud. So we're delighted to have you with us, Bob, and very excited to hear what your message is for the European Commission, perhaps not so polite as the message of the Irish Minister. Always going to be polite. It will oh. definitely be polite. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to your input too. And last but not least, Matthew McDermott. Matthew is the Director of Growth at Access Partnership. That's a consultancy leading on tech and advising companies on overcoming oh, regulatory oh. barriers. So Matthew, great to see you as well. And I believe we have um, a connection as well online. We have Elena Fersman, that's the VP and head of Ericsson Global AI Accelerator and also a professor in cyber <laughs> physical systems at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Good morning to you. Can you hear us? Can you see us? I do hear you. I do see you. Thank you so much. Do you hear me? Lovely. We're delighted to have you with us today, albeit virtually. Uh, looking forward to hearing as well from you. But here on the panel, perhaps we can start um, maybe with ladies first. Gemma here <laughs> beside me. Sure. Um, just regarding your thoughts, perhaps, on where the world is regarding AI. I mean, it feels like the race is on to regulate it, but are we almost too late to the race? Oh, we're never late to do things right <laughs> and to protect people. And I think that's what democracies are about. That's what regulation is about. It's about protecting people. In this case, in technology processes, the, what is unusual is how much of the far west uh, the space of AI is right now. Um, I often say when I, when I do public speaking that in the 19th century, you could buy cocaine in pharmacies. That was because there was no regulation. You could okay. test vaccines on poor people because there was no regulation. Regulation in democracies is about protecting people. Uh, what, is, what is very unusual is that around tech, we have not been able to protect people, and we've been really struggling at what does protection mean in, uh, in those spaces. Um, I often say that my work is building the seatbelts of AI, and I think it's, it's, it's a, a metaphor that really works. Um, when seatbelts were developed, it was Volvo that developed them. The regulator said, we want cars to be safe. And the industry said, OK, let's invest in safety. And Volvo came up with the seatbelts. They released the patent. And today, you wouldn't think of buying or selling a car without a seatbelt. The problem that I see in Europe is that we have kind of sketched what a seatbelt would look like uh, for AI, but we're letting others produce it. Um, my main concern is that I think Europe has led in the regulation, but the regulation means nothing unless it becomes seatbelts. 
caring about safety means nothing if no one comes up with a seatbelt. And no one's doing that in Europe. I feel that Europe continues to invest in regulation, but not in the enforcement and the market that needs to come out after this. And we're letting this um, to the US, quite frankly, or even China. Just one, one, one piece to, um, to finish. The company that capitalized the most on GDPR was a company based in Texas, OneTrust, that developed the cookie um, notices. Today, OneTrust is valued at $5 billion. I feel that the companies that are going to capitalize on the AI Act are also in the US. Okay, Gemma, we're going to stop you there and bring in perhaps the perspective from Matthew McDermott there. Reaction to what um, you've heard there from Gemma and also your, also your thoughts on the EU's um, AI Act proposal. Well, I think our clients are looking at whether AI is a genuine shift in technology or just a change in platform. And the way that we think about that and the way we think about the regulation is will the use cases win out? Will this be thin wrappers around a foundational model uh, where the way that we all experience AI will be through the use case, in which case it's just software? Or will this be the change from programming to graphical user interfaces? Will this be a shift where everybody has access to infinite interns and the potential is, is limitless? And from a regulatory perspective, uh, the way um, I think in AI we often look to the, the car and horse metaphors, uh, let's make sure that we're regulating the right thing. Let's be comfortable that we've got it wrong today. Let's be comfortable about realizing we're on a journey. And as we think about it, make sure that what we're regulating is the car and not just regulating another horse. Okay, a lot of car metaphors here this morning. I like it. And I feel like we should all, in fact, be fastening our seatbelts as we have this discussion because. As we've heard earlier, the technology is developing much, much faster than trialogues or discussions that can take place at EU member state level. But um, let's hear now from perhaps Davio. I mean, AI, I imagine, has transformed your life. I mean, you're using it on a daily basis. Um, what's your take on how it will transform the world and also where the world is at regarding regulating it? Um, and how it will transform the world? Um, I'd love to have an answer to that. Um, um, it's relatively hard to do that, and I think that's the, f the thing which is quite interesting right now is that you have all those experts, you know, Jan LeCun, uh, all the others, they have all the discussion on what will be the impact. They don't know, basically, and I think Minister uh, Kovny, I really like his approach of looking at that as well. We don't, I, to be honest, I don't know either. I have ideas and I, have, uh, I can, and gi can give you my ideas, but there's one thing, sure, we can't predict the future. Um, that's almost impossible. Um, but what I don't like today is that we're trying to build rules for things that we don't understand. And that's where it, I mean, we, we, and I think that the summary of, of Mr. Coveney was really what I had, what I have in my head. We're over-regulating and under-innovating. Mm -hmm. um, th the thing is with the risk-based approach, I like the idea. The concept is very nice. Eh? You have risks, you have categories, and based on that, you have mitigation methods. But the problem with it is risk is a combination of impact and probability. And you need to understand what is the impact and what is the probability. But today, <laughs> nobody here really understands that. And those that do understand are probably the ones in open AI, in inflection AI, in deep mind, the ones that are really into it. And they don't have aligned incentives. Whatever you say, if it's now because of market protection, they, their incentives are not aligned. And in Europe, we have no clue. And we're not doing anything about it either, in my opinion. We're talking to them, yeah, but open AI wants regulation. That's clear for them, it's just a win. Um, so they don't have an incentive to really balance that. And I don't see anyone looking for a solution to do that, to balance how do we not, because even if you have those categories, <laughs> who holds anyone back now that we just don't throw in stuff that we don't really understand and we overregulate stuff. Uh, th this, for instance, education. One of the nicest examples that I've seen from Sal Khan, Khan Academy, a US-based uh, company, is the idea of solving the Two Sigma problem, which is in private tutoring. So the Two Sigma problem is a, a study from a, a, a pedagogist, um, Benjamin Bloom. And what he basically says is, if everyone would have uh, private tutoring, you can make of average students the best students. Eh? It's a normal curve and you can shift two sigmas. The thing is private tutoring is expensive and is inaccessible for most people. AI can do that at scale. 
it can do private tutoring at scale, and it solves the two sigma problem at scale. What are we doing in Europe? We're putting education in the high risk bucket because we think it's dangerous. We don't really understand it, and we make a huge burden and administrative hassle to get that done. And our customers, so and we're working for some of the largest in the world, GSK, USUB, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Atlas Copco, they all think the same, like, okay, what will this mean? It creates uncertainty, it creates administrative hassle, and that's for large companies. What if, as a startup, you want to innovate? You don't even know if I start with doing this, what are the risks? What are the potential backlashes in terms of punishments I'll have? It's impossible. So... Um, Let's just stop you there. I mean, you have a lot to say, and we're <laughs> listening loud and clear. Um, pity we don't have the European Commissioner in the room to listen as well. She will be here, though, a little bit later, so we can pose all your comments and questions to her. Um, Bob, from Amazon there, you were nodding along there with what you heard. I mean, what would you whisper in the ears of, of those regulating on this AI Act here in the next couple of weeks? What would the message from... Amazon be? I would say, uh, with the words that many have said already, it needs to be risk-based. So you start with a risk-based approach. And then I would also caution uh, the team to slow down a little bit to be sure you've got the definitions right. You have to have the definitions right when you're at the first stages of this regulation, and you have to be focused on areas where there's true risk. And what I see today worries me a little bit because some of the definitions being used, things like there's the producer and the user of an AI system, are not definitions used by people who work in AI every <coughs> day, which I do. I work on this every single day. So this idea that there's these two groups, producers and users, it doesn't work that way. There are producers who develop AI systems, but then there are developers who use those AI systems in much more complex systems, often involving four or five other types of AI to come up with the final solution. It is far more complex than it appears on the surface. And so figuring out how to get that regulation right so it doesn't stifle development is really important. And to get regulation right, any, any contract, involves definitions, and we got to get those definitions right. So I'd really like to spend a little more time on that with the commission to be, be sure, let's define the landscape, and then we can regulate it much more effectively. Well, Gemma here, who's on the panel, is actually working as an advisor to the European Commission. So in just a minute, I'd like to ask you what advice you're giving them, and if you think that politicians find this just too complicated as well uh, to regulate. But first, uh, of course, Elena Fersman has been listening in as well to the discussions this morning, Elena from Ericsson. Um, any reactions to what, we've heard, what you've heard so far, and what's your take? Yes, absolutely. I would like to reflect on that things that have been said. I think um, um, one thing about predicting the future and how, how does it look like. So if we speak about, like in general terms, predicting the future and where AI is taking us, of course, it's very difficult to say. Then when I speak for, uh, for our industry, for telecom industry, um, the telecom industry or the Ericsson, um, you know, development and manufacturing that has been out around for 140 years, I think the, um, the development and the future is pretty... I mean, the trajectory it is to follow because uh, what we've seen is that we're automating a lot, we're improving the performance of the networks, we're performing, uh, improving the, uh, the footprint, the CO2 footprint of the networks. Uh, the network's infrastructure will never be perfect. That's why we're using AI. So it's essentially um, contributing to optimize the imperfections or minimize the impact of the imperfections of the network, right? Because it's still a limited resource, uh, telecom networks. So, and then uh, to reflect to what we said, it's not only producers and users. I like this um, statement that uh, there are so many more functions because in my domain, there is development, manufacturing, rollout, maintenance, operations, uh, that's that's everything before using, right? Is is and there is AI. AI plays a huge role in in any part there, obviously, and in infrastructure. Um, I think what's also very specific about um, telecom industry is that AI is playing a role in very quick decisions. So there are very a lot of quick control loops that are there, uh, meaning that when we are overimposing um, the trustworthy AI framework on that, uh, not every quick decision can be checked. 
So one needs to put these guardrails on the systems that are, that are kind of uh, regulating um, it at all, but we cannot, we can kind of check every time we take this uh, millisecond decisions right on the networks. And then I, I should also say, um, I think we said uh, when, when EU ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI were released, uh, or um, well, the pre-AI act, we as a company said, let us embrace it and let us uh, kind of follow these guidelines. So we never wrote our own guidelines for trustworthy AI, but we rather said, okay, this is good. Uh, let's start by working and uh, proactively, you know, building methods for uh, trustworthy AI, including uh, non-bias, uh, including explainability, uh, accountability, safety, and so on for all AIs that are running in our systems. And we we have actually AI running in all functions of, of our systems. Um, so I think it's, um, in a way, we saw it as a competitive advantage because uh, similar to, you know, security, uh, where I think historically, our software uh, that we've built were, were considered, you know, very reliable and secure. Mm -hmm. In a similar way, now that we are saying we are embedding AI in every function of the system, we need to be able to say, like, we have a very strong internal certification or audit function because it's okay, not only I'm about. Going to stop you there. Um, you're with us virtually, so if there's anything you want to react to that you hear on the panel, give a wave. I can see you perfectly, but I'm curious to get back to Gemma. Um, to the question that we posed to you earlier as um, an advisor to the European Commission there on whether or not this is too complicated and if you think politicians are competent enough in the field uh, to be able to, to get this right. Uh, so I'm, I am very privileged that I, that I get a chance to talk to the people that are, I believe, shaping the future. I think that politics is the space of strategic anticipation, is where we try to understand society and protect people in, in those societies. So I'm really privileged to be working with the Commission, with the Parliament, with the, uh, with the White House, because I am based in the, um, in, in the US. And my role is to provide technical input. So I've, I've been auditing AI systems for the last seven years together with the team at Ethicus. Uh, and we are trying to productize and, and build an AI auditing field. We just launched the International Association of Algorithmic Auditors, but like basically create a mechanism that allows us to land the, um, the, the regulation and provide solutions and make sure that uh, AI has, um, has seat belts. So my role when talking to um, politicians and policymakers is give them technical input from the ground. So like what are the things that you are thinking in an abstract way um, to protect people and how do they land in terms of technical specifications. Uh, one of the issues that we find, for instance, Europe has put a lot of um, effort and faith in the human in the loop. We just think if there's a human in an AI process, things are going to be fair and fine at the end. When we audit systems, what we find is that humans tend to reintroduce bias <laughs> and inefficiency into systems. So again, there's a really good intention on the part of the, um, of the policymaker, but when this lands in concrete terms, what we find is a, 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 a moment of uh, decision making that we cannot really uh, control or audit for. So I'm trying to like bring that expertise on the ground. What we have seen as well is that the far west scenario that we come from has also led to really bad technologies. AI around us right now is really bad quality AI. The things and the systems that surround us don't do what they say. They are not making the best decisions. Um, and so I, I don't agree with this idea that, you know, it's, it's, uh, we have too much bureaucracy and regulation is about just, uh, you know, documenting everything. Well, yes, because that's the way that we ensure that systems work well. And right now, they do not. Um, no one would have, been, would have accepted a vaccine that didn't go through a clinical trial. And I'm sure that decades ago, pharmace pharmaceutical companies were like, oh, you know, clinical trials are a lot of bureaucracy. Yes, but we... Um, luckily got to a point where you would not take a vaccine unless it went to a clinical trial because clinical trials protect people. That's what the regulation, uh, the regulation does. And unless we have regulation, the tech is going to be crap. The incentives in the industry are to develop really bad technologies that choose the wrong, um, the wrong worker when you're doing um, CV screening, uh, the wrong medical treatment when you're using AI in the medical field. You, we're just making really bad decisions. So I'm trying to bring I'm that kind of knowledge the other Would you agree with what you're hearing there? <laughs> I just can't agree with that. I'm sorry. Fine. It's okay. Let's just, that's uh, why we're here. We're not I, here I, to I agree. Don't, I don't necessarily think uh, regulation <laughs> is what makes great products. Uh, great engineers and great business people who care about their customers create great products. They create those great products because they listen to their customers every day. They get that feedback every day. They implement that every day for their customers. It's not because of a 
It's not because of a regulation that someone develops some transformative, you know, human changing product. I don't think that regulation does that. Regulation helps it remain safe and in bounds, but I don't think I don't think that's what makes a great product. No, regulation sets the playing field. What we are missing in AI are the Volvos, the companies willing to innovate in the safety solutions that will make AI better. The, what is unusual about the current moment is that we have regulators saying high level things, which is what they should do, and the industry is like, we're not gonna do anything un un until you tell us exactly what we need to do. The regulators have never done that. They s with cars, they say cars need to be safe. Industry, work it out. When the regulators have launched that, have put that in front of the industry, the industry did not react. We still see lack of compliance with GDPR that was passed seven years ago. Um, I don't want to think about what's going to happen with the, with the AI Act. The industry is missing in the, in the proposal of solutions, and that is a huge gap that we have. But I don't think it's the policymakers that are not doing their job. Okay. I think it's Navio, the industry that's um, not stepping up. What, what's your take on all that? Um, so, uh, to your reaction to my point, it's for me, it's not about regulation is not necessary. It's not about people are not doing the right job. It's about the fact that there's information asymmetry. The industry knows more than the politicians, and the industry today is often big tech and not well aligned with what we want. So, and I think we need to very m make sure that we really understand something before we make regulation, or make sure that we do it in a way that it's that we understand the impact of what we're regulating, and we don't do that today. Seat belts, I like the example, but as far as I remember, I wasn't born probably yet, but I think in the beginning cars didn't have seat belts. Of course. Why didn't they have it? Exactly. Because they didn't understand the, the risk yet. They, and you say they didn't add it because they didn't want to, because they didn't understand the risk yet. It wasn't clear enough. And once it was clear, it got into regulation, because it was clear that that could solve a lot of problems. But now we're trying to build seat belts without understanding what the risk is. So we're actually building a harness around people in the car and strapping them to the car, and which Davio is an overregulation, I mean in my opinion. Davio, your company, you started with three, I understand, and now yes. you're 50. Yes. And could this kind of reg regulation scare you so much that you would want to, you know, be somewhere else and move out of Belgium? Well, what we notice is just, so we work for other, co we, uh, we help other companies in their AI journey. And what we notice is that it becomes more interesting for companies to do it outside of Europe than inside of Europe. And that's the thoughts that they will be having, which is not something that we want, I assume. And so, and I think one problem is the information asymmetry that we don't really know what we're regulating. Mm. And a solution should be that we understand it better. And combine that with the fact that we're not innovating fast enough, I think there are, there's huge potential, for instance, um, instead of putting all the money in a lot of other stuff in Europe, um, putting it into supporting, for instance, supercompute for universities or research centers or startups, that they can have means to compete, to really have a view in it. Because today, the reason we can't compete is because we don't have the, the, the mean. There's no supercomputers. The GPUs are Im impossible to get even if you have the money. And a major lack as well of startups I mean, in Europe. I mean, that's... Exactly. And if you get make that accessible, maybe with the premise that they should open source whatever they build on top of those supercomputers or put it into publication, that could really um, um, enforce or, or support collaboration and innovation and get a view on how does it work, what are the risks, what are not risks, and therefore support regulation. Matthew, these are the conversations you're having as well with your clients, uh, translating their concerns as well. For sure. Uh, I think from our client's perspective, um, we want to build on what's already gone before. Uh, what can we learn? And the, uh, for example, with the private sector, uh, as we've heard, industry is already working with AI uh, every day um, in a very flexible way, responding to regulatory and client needs. What can we take from that? And the second piece we're looking at is also sectoral regulation. The way that we experience, well, we all experience AI today, and the way that we're protected is through sectoral regulation. Now, that is quite fragmented, uh, both within one economy and across many economies, and there's a need for a coordination function, a way of ensuring that we don't think about this just as technology and technology regulation, but as uh, the way that we, we, li we live our lives and the way that we benefit in healthcare or transport or, or retail. That may sound impossible, that may sound uh, pie in the sky, 
But during the pandemic, the WHO was able to create a pandemic visa, push that through, and get that to work globally. Uh, there were risks. People thought it couldn't be done, but it happened. In a post-pandemic environment, maybe we put that in a regulatory sandbox, maybe we, we minimize those risks, but let's keep that regulatory ambition. These things can be done. These things can be done. A positive message there from Matthew. Bob, I believe um, at Amazon you've been doing a lot of research into the digital decade and you'll have yes. some interesting reports coming out in January. Can you give us a little teaser into yeah. what, what, we, what we can keep an eye out for? Yeah, we've been looking at what will it take for Europe to take advantage of AI as part of this digital decade. And that report will be published sometime in the next couple of months. But some of the early details are interesting. Um, one of them is that Companies that are already using AI are finding significant benefits. So the companies that have already embraced, they're already building it as part of their, as part of their daily processes, are seeing uh, sort of 75% of them are seeing increases in revenue and increases in innovation. And they're also planning to do larger investments over the long haul. So people using it now are already seeing a significant benefit. And the places where we're seeing challenges our companies can't find the people to do the work. They can't find enough uh, tech savvy employees who can come in and help them with the work. And that's having a real impact on almost nearly half of the companies that we surveyed are having trouble finding those people. And, and then the, the, one of the final pieces that's directly uh, interesting for what we're talking about today is that for companies who don't have regulatory clarity, and that's about 50% of them who don't have a clear line of sight from the regulation on what they're doing are planning to invest materially less over the next few years. So that lack of clarity in the regulation has a direct impact on what companies are willing to invest. So that will make a difference. So one of the things I think that will be important for Europe going forward here is making sure that the regulation provides the right level of clarity so people aren't you, you can't need a crystal ball to know what to do. It has to be clear in the regulation. I think that's a really clear statement coming out of the research. Uh, and it's really challenging for smaller companies, right, who don't have large law departments, who can fight their way through a complex or ambiguous set of regulations. Make it clear, make it simple. I think that's gonna be important, especially at this early phase. Uh, at this very early phase, when we don't even know what people are gonna do with this technology, I think you have to be a little cautious not to go too big too early. It can be incrementally built on the regulation over time. It doesn't have to be everything all at once. Okay, I will start looking around the room to see if we have any questions. We have a lot of questions, hands popping up. We have about 10 minutes um, for questions. I have a couple in as well online, so we'll have to keep them quite brief. Gentlemen there at the back, and then we'll take yourself. And there was one, I think, over there as well. Just introduce yourself, please. Hi, uh, I'm Connor Dunlop. I'm from the Ada Lovelace Institute. Um, I had a question um, basically regarding the information asymmetries that you mentioned. Um, so yeah, at our institute, we strongly agree this is one of the big challenges that we face, the information asymmetry between leading developers and regulators. Um, but right now, we don't have regulation and th there's like zero transparency. So I'm wondering how do we address that information asymmetry without regulation? Like in our view, we need transparency, um, third party assessment, um, yeah, red teaming with externals, audits to Gemma's uh, work. Um, so yeah, without regulation, how can we incentivize reducing this information asymmetry? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your question. The gentleman here at the front, Christoph. Uh, Microphone is coming. There you go. Yep. Thank you. Hi, Christoph Zeng. Uh, AAA.ai Association and worldai.org. Uh, I have three questions. The first one Came is prepared. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go just for it. Wrote it. wrote them right now. Um, the first one is about uh, the maker and user classification. We were talking about that. And uh, mm -hmm. can we not categorize every stakeholder into these two categories? Say, for example, an integrator or a wrapper is both a user and a maker, right? So yeah. for, this, for the just the sake of uh, simplification to, uh, to, otherwise we will have an endless uh, number of uh, categories we can, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as the, the industry develops, the, the types of uh, uh, categories will grow exponentially. Okay. 
And the second question is about the risk-based approach. Uh, is it possible to determine all risks given that even Sam Altman himself doesn't really know what's going on and what's possible? Okay. Uh, isn't risk definition too deterministic since it requires to know what's possible first and then evaluate the risk? As said, we're regulating a moving target. Uh, are we even able to define risks and mitigate them as fast as AI develops. So That's the third a question, question we've asked already today. Yeah. And the third Just question? The last, last question. Yeah. Uh, people who work f with customers create great products. Perfectly, yeah, I hear. But is that really totally true? Are people who work with customers paying attention to risks and challenges if no compliance definition yet exists? Or are they more attentive on the needs and requirements of charging more man hours and subscription fees. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your three questions. Uh, we had one lady there at the back of the room. We'll take your question and then we will come up to our panel. And Elena, if you want to tackle any of those questions there as well, we can come to you. Um, so I, I'm Alex from the Future of Life Institute and I wanted to provide another, I guess, perspective on a point that was brought up about uh, how this is a multi-stakeholder industry with uh, really um, long, I guess, uh, chains of providers that provide a tool to someone else who then develops it and then deploys it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in an industry which is dealing with a new technology that has, you know, uh, not been properly assessed in the past, wouldn't regulation provide a certain clarity for those downstream providers um, who are smaller companies, um, who have smaller legal teams? Um, and with regards to you know regulation and uh, understanding things like the AI Act, uh, our institute has actually developed a tool uh, to try to uh, provide that clarity and sort of um, provide a sort of assessment for mm -hmm. uh, smaller companies okay. to understand their compliance. Um, with the AI Act as it evolves. So Great. wouldn't tools like that pop up and solve some of the problems that we're discussing here? Okay, thank you so much uh, for your question and your reference. We have a couple of questions as well online there. Um, where can Europe find enough people who know how to use and develop new technologies? That's something we mentioned as well. Um, the European Union as the world's regulatory superpower. Can it step up to greatly influence the trajectory of AI governance, however lacking technological leadership in hardware and software. And another question, are we heading for the Brussels effect or the Strasbourg effect, the framework convention <coughs> in the rest of the democratic world? Uh, in the other panels, we can get back to some of those questions online. But now, I think at this late stage, I might just invite all our panelists to give kind of a one minute, two minute wrap, taking into consideration all the questions we've had from the audience and also what you've heard this morning. Gemma, would you like to to start. Sure, why not? Um, first, I'd like to question this idea that um, companies and clients create great products. Historically, that's not correct. <laughs> Without regulation, buildings fall on people. Without regulation, cars don't have seat belts. Uh, without regulation, you would fall of our chairs. You would fall of your chairs. The chairs you're sitting on have had to prove that they can hold the weight of a human to be sold. We make demands on chairs that are far greater than the demands that we make on technology developers that are targeting children or older people that may not have the resources that they need to use those systems safely. Um, so historically, great products are built under democracies that uh, ensure there's regulation to protect people when using those, uh, those systems. As for the information asymmetries, that's, that's, th that's the key. And one of the reasons why we moved, I'm European, but we moved to the US and our, um, um, our holding is now uh, in, in the US, in Delaware, um, is because that's where the debate is at right now in the US. It's about auditing, it's about the transparency of the metrics that policymakers need in order to make good decisions. Um, I wouldn't say that policymakers cannot know what developers don't know. The problem is that policymakers don't have the information. We don't have data on false positives and false negatives. We don't have uh, data on error rates. Until we have that, policymakers will not be able to regulate. So in the executive order that Biden passed um, last week, one of the key issues is the transparency of the specific metrics that will allow policymakers to make 
make, uh, to make decisions, and auditing is a key part of that process. Can we have thir uh, trusted third parties that audit those systems and share the key metrics with policymakers so that policymakers can make sure that people are, uh, that people are protected? Um, um, yeah, and I think that's, I, I that's wanted to, to get to another um, question, but I, um, I think that's it. Uh, and just let me just finish on one thing. Mm -hmm. I am not the regulator. <laughs> I am the industry. <laughs> I'm just an industry that believes that we can build better products in, within the limits of the regulation. AI that cannot respond to people's needs is bad AI. Regulated AI is better AI, and we see that every single day when we audit systems. When engineers have the incentives to focus on impacts on people, they develop better technologies. Right now, this getting together or of clients and companies is leading to, for instance, me as a woman getting between 10 and 20 times less banking services because women are underrepresented in training data. And no one has the incentive to make sure that women are treated equally when we go to a bank. We need to create those, in those incentives to ensure that we all have the same opportunities when faced with services where AI is making decisions. Thank you. Okay, Gemma, thank you very much for that. Very passionate intervention and wrap, getting all your messages out there loud and clear. Elena, I would like to just cross over to you now just to get your uh, take and if you can tackle some of those questions that, that you heard. Yes, yes. Uh, I would like to reflect on this, um, on the last question about tools popping up. Obviously, we can see a lot of tools popping up uh, to address the regulations, to explain the regulations to companies and um, to kind of prevent and do this testing and certifications, right? And that, I think it's great that we have a lot of companies addressing that. But uh, uh, kind of continuing on the analogy of the seatbelt, I think in practice we'll need to have several levels of seatbelts. And, and there is also a difference between big industries and smaller, smaller companies, right? Because in big industries, it's... Uh, this type of regulations or safety guardrails, this is a competitive advantage. Obviously, when we sell to our customers, they want to make sure that the system is safe. The domain is complex, so we are, we are building the seat belts. We cannot go without building seat belts, but we do need to have several levels of seat belts. When we okay, build so our own seat belt, that's not a black box because we, we know exactly the domain and that's a white box seat belt. Then, of course, there should be another levels of seat, seat belts. Okay, lots of levels of different seatbelts. That's what the future could hold. And Christoph, I'm looking at you there. In case your questions are not answered as articulately as you would like, there will be a coffee break in a couple of minutes so you can, you can have them answered then. But perhaps, Matthew, would you like to be next? Thank you. I, I think thinking through all these questions about will re regulations create greater clarity? Um, will they allow us to build better models? Um, I, I go back to Bob's point about definitions. Uh, what is it we're trying to regulate here? Is it foundational models? Is it applications? Where in the stack are we looking? Do they all need to be treated the same way? And for each of those, what is the market failure? What are we trying to fix? And I think understanding that more clearly will allow us to create better regulation that will achieve the outcomes that all of us want here today. To the question of the Brussels effect, I don't think we're going to see a copy and paste of the AI Act around the world like with GDPR. Um, I think this time around there were more um, competitors. The US has moved a lot more quickly to create a framework around how to regulate AI. China has a, a more vertical approach to regulation that may be tempting to some countries. But there was a gap here for Europe. The AI Act is more complete. Uh, and rather than looking to push regulation on the rest of the world, if what we talk about is using the AI Act to enable this balance between responsibility and innovation, and that what we're doing is growing the pie for all, then the AI Act really could be transformative around the world. Okay, Davio? Um, yeah, f the thing is, I'm, uh, the perception based on discussion maybe that I'm against regulation, which is definitely not the case. Uh, okay. I think regulation is necessary, but it should be to make sure things are safe, not to make good products. That's something else. Good products come from companies, reg uh, safe uh, products come from regulation sometimes. Now, the thing is, um, what I still don't, the example that you give, the, the um, not discriminating women, the depth of that problem, if you have to do that for every application, the laws you'll need to write to solve that, and the speed at which that is evolving is impossible to deal with. We can't do that. It's, it's changing so fast. We need to, you need, don't need to look at the errors, you need to look at what the risks are and on a higher level. 
I don't, uh, this is, it's coming to, even in this discussion, to be honest, I'm not sure if people are still following what are all the things are we're saying after this whole day. It needs to be a lot simpler and a lot more. Let's ask, are you following everything you've heard? <laughs> Does it make sense? <laughs> yeah? The big lines, but, but the thing is, all the discussions that I've heard so far go in all different directions. It needs to be very, very simple and, and regulation. But how? Yeah, but how? I mean... But understanding it better is number one. That's really number one. And that's one. why we're here. That's why we've gathered to understand it better. But the technology, understanding the, the technology a lot better. And we don't have access to really understand like the, the, uh, how far they are already in research within, for instance, OpenAI or other institutions. It's a lot further than what we've seen today. They're a lot further. They already see a lot more risks than we have access to. We don't see them. We don't, we don't know them. Okay, we are working on large language models at customers as well, but not at the same level that they are already. We don't, we don't, we th that's locked in their box that we don't have access to. Mm. Locked in their box, okay. <laughs> Bob, I think it's super important, <laughs> to super important to stay focused on risk-based regulation. There are so many uses of AI that are just fundamentally not risky. They're just not risky. Like, what, what music should be played at my dinner party tonight based on the mood I'm in today? Doesn't matter. Like, that's AI. Turns out it's not important if they play the wrong music at my dinner party tonight. That's okay. So risk-based regulation, I think, is going to be really important. I think you want the right regulators thinking about that risk. When I talked about this issue with a bunch of um, regulators and legislators in the U.S., one of the things they focused on was... We want to make sure we have experts on things like the Food and Drug Administration or the National Highway Transportation Safety Organization that understand how to regulate their domains incredibly well. They are the deepest experts. We want them to decide what, what's the level of risk and how should AI be regulated in those domains. And I, I think that type of thought process is really important. Like, let's get the risk regulation right and let's be careful about it. Uh, and then I think... I think on the, I think on the um, final piece here is just international standards will matter in the definitions. Like as you think about the definitions of what is AI and who is a developer and who is a deployer and what ro responsibilities should they have, I think that's going to be fundamental to getting this right. Using a language that is understood and used by the industry. Like the industry has a way of thinking about and talking about these problems. We have developers who build AI systems, but they aren't necessarily the deployers. They don't know the use case. That's going to be the deploying organization. They understand the use case. They understand the risk. They understand their business. They understand the complexity of the application within which they've embedded not likely one, but two, three, and four different AIs. It's that deployer who has to be fundamentally responsible for understanding the risk and the regulatory regime that applies to them. That has to underlie any regulation or it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, broken on day one. It's going to be broken on day one. Okay, thank you so much, um, Bob Kimball, for that. And thanks also to Elena Fersman the VP and head of Ericsson Global at AI Accelerator for joining us uh, remotely. A bit of a challenge to join us remotely, but we're so happy that you could do and be with us as well uh, this morning. Thank you as well to Matthew McDermott, Director of Growth and Access at, or at Access Partnership, a consultancy on um, advising tech companies. Um, Davio, great to have you with us as well this morning. Um, so interesting to get your perspective and hear what you're doing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and how AI is, is kind of driving you and in your company. And Gemma, pleasure as well to have you with us as well and hear your, your take. Are you excited or petrified about how AI will, will change our lives? Really excited. Really excited, okay. Really excited. Well, on that very positive note, um, I will conclude this panel, ladies and gentlemen, which of course was the first panel of many taking place uh, later today. But as you've seen on the program, the panels are quite short and there's a long lunch break as well for you to, to interact and connect. And we will also have a networking reception after we hear from Vera Jourova. That's the vice president of uh, the European Commission. But for now, thank you so much for your attention, all those here in the room and all those as well with us online. We promise to get to your questions throughout the day with the other moderators. And uh, we look forward to seeing you later. If you could, all those in the room, be back here um, at 10.55, I'm being told at my ear. So that gives you about... 20 minutes, I think. So I'll see you there. In any case, I will give you a heads up and gather you again. Thank you so much. Take care and enjoy the day. Thank you.